Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, faced with aggressive COVID cases, Ontario treads softly. We need to start vaccinating education workers and essential workers now. What is the delay? Toronto isn't waiting. It's taking some 300,000 children out of schools. New concerns in Alberta about cases of a variant and transparency about them. I just learned that now. Somebody told me, one of my customers told me about it. What a hot housing market means for policymakers, sellers, and buyers. You need to expect that that price is going to go up by three hundred dollars to $600,000. And what it takes to rebuild a food chain. If you start with the herring and work up, it can happen. The importance of the humble herring. This is The National. We are starting tonight with breaking news from Ontario. The province has seen a spike in cases propelled by variants that has caused enormous concerns about the impacts on hospitals, ICUs and frontline staff. The calls for action from doctors have been loud and increasingly urgent. But until now, the government has seemed to resist decisive moves. There was a late day cabinet meeting in Ontario today and CBC News has learned that new measures will come into effect tomorrow at midnight. Those measures will include an emergency declaration with a stay at home order and there's a lot more planned. What does this all mean? What will be closed? What stays open? Magda Gabrasalasa has been chasing the details and joins us now. So Magda, can you walk us through what we now know about the stay at home order? Well, a lot of changes coming through. So we know that the stay at home order uh, will be province wide. And this is something we were expecting to hear. But uh, now we know that, in fact, that will be announced. So let's talk about what's open and what's closed. This is uh, essentially going to impact the non-essential businesses more, more than anything else. So those retail shops, they can no longer have customers inside their stores during the current shutdown that we've been under. They were allowed to do that. Now those retail shops will have to rely on curbside and delivery. What about those big box stores? Well, they can only keep the pharmacy and the uh, grocery aisles open. Everything else has to be blocked off. As for what's staying open, grocery stores, Pharmacies are staying open. Garden centers are staying open as well. And this, of course, is, is a means to kind of address what we've been seeing in the last few days. There have been videos of large crowds in different various settings, whether it's malls or big box stores. And so these restrictions really uh, moving to address some of that. And what we know is that they will be in place for at least four weeks and police enforcement will be part of this, Adrian. OK, so that's interesting. That will probably take a little while to get into effect. But but are you hearing reaction to any of these renewed restrictions? Well, we have been hearing from doctors for days now. They have been calling for a stay at home order. So no doubt they'll be pleased to hear that that is being put in place. But earlier today, we, we spoke with doctors who had signed a letter, more than 200 of them who had asked the province to put in a, a more stricter measures, including a stay at home order. They also asked for paid sick days for essential workers, the vaccination of essential workers to be prioritized, having 24 hour vaccination sites also uh, be put in place. And all of this was to address what is uh, the surging cases of COVID in this province. We know today more than 3,000 new cases, hospitalizations are up, ICU admissions. In fact, 510 people are in the ICU. That is the most that uh, has been recorded since the pandemic began. And so these doctors had sent this letter to the province asking for stricter measures and that, you know, it would take stricter measures to really put a stop to the spread of this virus. And of course, now we know that a stay at home order is being put in place for at least four weeks. So some of the requests that those doctors have made will be met, Adrian. Indeed, so none of this has been announced yet. We know we're expecting to hear more from the premier tomorrow. This is just what CBC News has been able to learn tonight. We also heard that Ontario is expanding 
vaccine eligibility. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, that was the other uh, big news today. We knew, we heard that um, the province was moving vaccinations to people that were, uh, you know, 50 in non um, 50 in hot zones. So. That was uh, uh, the big news, but then we were he hearing criticism for, from others who were saying, you know what, the province really needs to vaccinate younger essential workers, that that needed to be a priority. Now, those younger essential workers are not going to be made a priority until mid-May, possibly, and that's what we were hearing. We were hearing a lot of criticism. I spoke to one teacher who said, Teachers, essential workers really need to get those vaccines. Now, uh, a grocery store owner told me he's worried about taking the virus home and he wants to get uh, the vaccination. He wants his workers to be vaccinated as well and they want to be made a priority right now. We may hear that things may change and they may be become the priority in the next few days, but we should learn more tomorrow. Okay, thank you, Magda. I was certainly listening to you talk mobile vaccinations will be part of what we understand is coming later on in the show. Uh, everyone, we will we'll see that, a team going door to door in a critical Toronto neighborhood. Thank you for all that work, Magda. Thank you. You're welcome. British Columbia surpassed 1,000 daily cases for just the fifth time today, and all five times have come in the past week. That's part of the reason the province is moving to the next phase of its vaccine plan, which includes an online registration that, as Briar Stewart shows us, some 160,000 people signed up for. Gary Gates had his son Lucas by his side when he got his shot this afternoon at this casino-turned-vaccination clinic. I want to be protected from my kids because both have special needs, one with... Uh, Asperger's and one with Down syndrome, so now I feel safer being around other people and then coming home. You have to give credit to the, where credit is due. Every and Lucas yeah, logged on this morning and signed him and his mother up for shots once they're eligible. Well, I feel absolutely fantastic knowing the fact that the, the light at the end of the tunnel is closer. BC launched an online booking system today. Those over 71, along with Indigenous adults and those with certain chronic conditions, can book their shots now. Everyone else can register and will be notified when it's their turn. It was the simplest website I've ever been into. It just was four questions answered, entered, and that was it. The process much smoother than when the phone system launched last month and many reported spending hours trying to get through. We all become a little bit safer and we will get through this next few months until all of our communities are protected. But not everything is full steam ahead. Essential workers were getting the AstraZeneca vaccine, but that program is paused because of concerns it could be linked to rare blood clots. Instead, those doses are being given to people between the age of 55 and 65, where the risk is believed to be much lower. It's really critical that essential workers get vaccinated, especially when we're looking at the numbers in BC, as I say. And the number of exposure notifications to schools over the long weekend was quite overwhelming. The province is hoping to start vaccinating more essential workers later this month once it receives a shipment of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. BC's goal remains to have everyone eligible receive their first shot by the end of June. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. As more and more Canadians sign up to get a shot, the federal government is celebrating that vaccine milestone today. More than 10 million vaccine doses have now been delivered to the provinces and territories. That includes nearly 700,000 from Pfizer that arrived just this week. In total, 67% of all the vaccine doses received have been administered across the country. So that gap between doses received and doses administered was highlighted by the health minister today. And as David Cochran shows us, Ontario's premier just took that as a reason to fire back. The political focus has largely been on the number of doses coming into the country. But that's shifting to how long it takes to get those doses into arms. Why can't you, you get this done faster? What's the problem here? Okay, so I'm going to respectfully disagree with you here. Ontario's premier forced to explain after this series of tweets from the federal health minister, in which Patty Haidu pointed out how many doses her government has delivered, how many have been used, and how many are sitting in freezers. I saw some tweet from the federal minister, oh, we, we, we have a million and 
I don't know, million three in the freezers. We just got those. We literally got them a few days ago. So before that, we're running out and we'll continue to run out. Canadians expect access to this information. They want to have credible sources of information. Haidu denies her tweets were intended to provoke or suggest provinces were moving too slow. But it comes after a tough winter where Premier Canada, under Mr. Trudeau's leadership, is behind many third world developing countries. After Premier. Enough's enough. This is becoming a joke. We need more vaccines. Simple as that. Politicize the vaccine supply. Well, I think we're in a situation where everyone is exhausted. But in a battle over shots, the Prime Minister held his fire, stressing a Team Canada approach, even though teamwork is in short supply. This has been a very, very long year. Uh, and as a federal government, uh, we've not engaged uh, in pointing fingers or laying blame or judging. We're not going to do that. Haidu says her tweets weren't a provocation, but they're also not a one-time thing. She plans to give weekly updates on vaccine deliveries and vaccine use and let the numbers and the premiers speak for themselves. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Quebec's seven-day average is pushing higher, and the premier is warning April will be dangerous. So today, action on two fronts, tightening restrictions and opening up who's allowed to get the vaccine. Alison Northcott takes us through all of it. We just opened uh, not even two weeks ago. So. Gym owner Louise Argumetis is facing yet another shutdown as Quebec tightens restrictions it only recently lifted. It was uh, enjoying the comeback. Everybody was so excited. Everybody was in a good mood. And um, I feel like closing the gyms down will uh, make things difficult for them. Quebec's premier says while Montreal's cases are more stable than other parts of the province, he worries that could change soon. The month of April will be critical. So in Montreal and other red zones, gyms will close, places of worship will have a capacity of 25, and high school students will go back to alternating days in class and online. I ask for a last effort. The variant is very dangerous. Please be careful. Last week, Quebec imposed a 10-day shutdown in some regions outside Montreal. With variants in those areas fueling transmission, the province needs to lower the risk everywhere, says this infectious diseases specialist. We risk to have an exponential growth in the number of cases if we keep the measures as, as they were. The province is also adjusting its vaccine rollout. After 5,000 vaccine appointments in Montreal went unbooked over the Easter weekend. I found it in the end of the Quebec's health minister, Christian Dubé, says it was hard to see that happen, but insists no doses were wasted, and the province is now preparing to expand access. Starting Thursday, Quebecers 55 and up can get the AstraZeneca vaccine, and tomorrow the health minister will lay out a plan to vaccinate essential workers and people with chronic illnesses. All those people living with that risk have been extremely stressed to get this. What is still stressful from the healthcare professional is that we still don't have a precise list of who, what are going to be those diseases. Teachers and other workers are also eager for details on when they will be offered the vaccine. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Today, Canada's top doctor warned against the spread of COVID variants, including the dangerous P1 strain first detected in Brazil. Her message, young people are vulnerable and the shield of vaccination may not be ironclad. We don't have enough information from other countries, including Brazil, about how well these vaccines work against P1. So the number of new ICU patients has jumped 18% since last week, and about a third of COVID patients in hospital now require intensive care. That is up from less than a fifth in mid-January. There is growing evidence that variants are causing that spike. Now, new outbreaks in Alberta involving the P1 variant have sparked concern and frustration in several communities. Many people say they were not adequately notified by government or health officials. Carolyn Dunn tracks that tonight. Slowly but surely, word about the P1 outbreak is spreading throughout Drayton Valley. I just learned that now. Somebody told me, one of my customers told me about it. I, I really didn't have an idea that we have that strain right now. 
This town of about 7,000 is one of three Alberta communities to learn the highly contagious P1 variant has hit a nearby workplace. An employee at this energy company brought the P1 variant from out-of-province travel to one of its sites. Soon it had spread to three different locations. One person is dead, two are in ICU. No one from Alberta Health Services informed the towns. The mayor of Edson, Alberta, found out about the outbreak at this PTW Energy Services site in the media. And our community has a lot of anxiety now because they don't know any information. I don't know any information. They look to me for information. I'm like, I don't know. Um, and absolute silence from Alberta Health on this. Hospitalizations and ICU admissions have been rising in Alberta. Highly contagious variants are now the driving force behind sharply rising caseloads. So Alberta is adding new restrictions, as much as its premier has been loath to do so. This morning, the COVID cabinet committee decided that we must take str make uh, strong steps to slow the spike and to start bending down the curve one last time. In-room dining and bars will be shut down again. All indoor social gatherings, in fact. Personal and medical services will stay open by appointment and schools are to remain open too. But many medical experts wonder if today's announcement is not too little too late. We expect that uh, the hospitals in Alberta will be in a uh, severe crisis in two to three weeks time. While vaccinations are ramping up by the day, things are likely to get worse before they get better. Again, Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. Well, south of the border, the U.S. president is pushing for an even faster pace in vaccinations. By no later than April 19th, in every part of this country, every adult over the age of 18, 18 or older will be eligible to be vaccinated. So that's nearly two weeks sooner than the previous May 1st deadline. So far, about 40% of adult Americans have gotten at least one dose of vaccine. That is far ahead of most countries. In total, the U.S. has, has administered 167 million doses. Now, here's an interesting twist on the vaccine story. There is growing evidence that they don't just protect you from getting COVID, but also that they seem to work as a treatment for long haulers, those people who continue to have sometimes debilitating symptoms even months after the illness. Vicodopia explains. When Elaine McCartney got sick with COVID-19 last April, the pain, fatigue, and mental fog wouldn't go away. I was going to the gym four times a week. I was running 5Ks twice a week. I could deadlift 100 pounds. And now I have trouble lifting a coffee cup some days. Then last month, she got the Pfizer shot. After a few days, her condition changed noticeably. I was able to go to the store on my own, which I haven't done for <laughs> eight months. Um, and my energy was up and my pain was less. Other patients are also seeing unexpected improvements. The first study out from the UK, still awaiting peer review, followed 44 hospitalized patients whose symptoms persisted. After their first shot, 27 of them had temporary side effects such as fever and headache. 10 saw some of their long COVID symptoms disappear and no one got worse from vaccines. There is a slight hint they might make things a bit better, although we're, we're a bit suspicious about that given the small numbers. There isn't yet a lot of published research into long COVID, especially in Canada. But in the U.S., which is farther ahead in vaccinating people with both shots, that hint of improvement is becoming significant. Very encouraging, but I think we're starting to pin down about a 40% um, of people are reporting either complete or significant improvement. This researcher is seeing that recovery in thousands of New York healthcare workers who had long COVID. But the science of why it's happening is still not understood. I think the most persuasive theory for me is that uh, the virus was never completely cleared or, or whatever remnants might still be there. Um, are now able to be cleared because the robust response that's triggered by the vaccines. Answers will come in time and will be welcomed by so many. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. There's no place like home, a feeling that's perhaps never been more relevant than in the past year. And hot new housing numbers from the Toronto area prove it. 
Home sales nearly doubled from last March to this March. The average selling price shot up by more than 21 percent, now just shy of $1.1 million. And it's not just Toronto or Vancouver anymore. As Peter Armstrong tells us, similar scenes are playing out across the country. Come on in, check it out. Slick videos and high gloss listings are now the norm in Canada's frenzied real estate market. Record low interest rates and a pandemic fueled drive for more space are pushing prices ever higher. Pre-COVID, your home was your castle. But during COVID, oh my God, you're working out from home, you're homeschooling from home, you're working from home and you're relaxing at home. So she says condo dwellers are buying houses, homeowners are buying bigger houses and others are buying cottages. And bidding wars mean the original listing price is, well, unrealistic. You need to expect that that price is going to go up by three hundred to $600,000. Obsessing over real estate is something of a national sport here. But some experts say even by Canada's overheated expectations, alarm bells are going off. In some ways, this is the most dangerous, uh, most dangerous buildup of prices that I've, that I've seen. And, you know, I've been, I've been doing this since the early 80s. His concern is that if things get too hot too fast, a correction becomes inevitable. We think something has to be done to cool demand before, you know, a lot of people get in over their heads. The question is what? Raising interest rates would do the trick, but that would slow the economic recovery from COVID. And some say if higher home prices are the cost of getting the economy back on track, so be it. I don't think we're facing something that's going to cause a major financial calamity in the economy. It's like a side effect of the medicine that we need to take in order to get the economy moving. For now, the policy priority is focused on getting COVID under control so shops can reopen and people can get back to work. Talk about sun filled. The gamble for policymakers and real estate agents alike is that the long speculated housing bubble bursts, making a historically bad situation much worse. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. Well, actors are calling on Hollywood to stop the pervasive stereotypes of Asian women in film. He's awesome. He is so funny. Yeah, yeah. The tropes perpetuated in pop culture and the impact they're having on real life. I don't leave. I think that this is like really scary. Plus, some Ontario hospitals are rolling out mobile vaccine clinics to reach people living in hotspots. We're doing vaccinations today. Would you like a shot? We get a first-hand look at the effort to reach those most at risk. And surfing on a river, a makeshift wave to ride all year round. It's winter, you just get a little bit thicker of a suit on and it's kind of the same. Is it though? Well, we're back in two. Welcome back. Police have been cleared in the death of a father in distress last June outside Toronto. Ontario Special Investigations Unit says when Ijaz Chowdhury was shot, he was carrying a knife and approaching Peel police officers. It says officers first tried to subdue him with a stun gun and rubber bullets. Chowdhury's death sparked weeks of protest. Peel police are conducting their own review. Weeks after the fatal shootings in Atlanta, Georgia, there is a reckoning about the portrayal of Asians in movies and shows, in particular Asian women, and especially the dehumanizing of them through sexualized stereotypes. Eli Glasner looks at what's being done to change that. Three Asian women, different backgrounds, different cities. Growing sense of... Of, of antagonism. You know, I'm scared not only for myself, but also, you know, my family members. It's really us who are under attack. The same concerns. The shootings at the spas in Atlanta that left six Asian women dead have reignited a conversation about how the media dehumanizes them. Moving image media is so powerful. In the past, Hollywood has often treated Asian women's sexuality as something to be feared or mocked. Me love you long time. The hurtful caricatures still pop up in popular sitcoms and cartoons. We buy, we buy, we buy. Oh, damn it. Asian women, young, old, they feel hypersexualized. You know, they feel this call, this definition being imposed upon them, which means that we must use media in order to define ourselves. My Korean name is Moran. 
Moron. That Comedian Margaret Cho says a reluctance to speak out is why anti-Asian yeah, hate crimes have that's been underreported. It's like a very uh, stoicized version of kind of holding in your suffering so that you don't appear weak. Have you carded any of the frat parties down the street? But Canadian actor and writer Amanda Joy is part of a new wave of voices. She remembers the advice an agent gave her when she started. Don't tell anybody that you're Filipino unless all you want to do is play maids and nannies. She still gets sent those roles. Part of the problem? She says producers are reluctant to hire people of color, even though databases are widely available. We literally made a website to make it easier, and people are, are still using the excuse that there's nobody qualified. But the success of Kim's Convenience and Oscar contender Minari are changing the narrative. We're at that sort of crossroads where things are going to come through and it's going to get better. It has to. As the industry starts to see the value of specific stories over stereotypes. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Well, today marks three years since the Humboldt Broncos bus crash. And tonight, the community held a special online memorial service. church bell rang 29 times, once for each person who was killed or injured when a truck plowed into the Broncos hockey team bus. The community is also planning to build a tribute center to honor the victims. Many Ontario doctors are calling on the provinces to vaccinate essential workers. Some hospitals are doing just that. Most of them are working in the food industry and so um, they needed the support. Community leaders taking the vaccine from clinics directly to those at highest risk. Plus, are there any clinical studies for any of the vaccines for youth? As the third wave forces some schools closed again, what would you ask a doctor about COVID and kids? Vaccines, variants, who's vulnerable? Stay with us. With much of the country firmly locked in a third wave, there is renewed worry over the variants, particularly in younger people. With increasing rates of infection, we are seeing a greater number of younger adults with COVID-19 being treated in hospital. And along with that concern, the snap decision we heard about earlier in the program, with a big swath of Ontario shutting down in-class learning, only to resume in about two weeks' time. So let's bring in infectious diseases specialist, Dr. Zane Chagla, and infectious diseases pediatrician, Dr. Fatima Kakar, to help answer some of your questions about kids, schools, and vaccines. Hello to the both of you. Dr. Chagla, we've got lots to get through, so let's get right to it. Um, you know, given the kind of crisis point that we're at, where hundreds of thousands of kids are being moved entirely to virtual learning, uh, let's start with this timely question from John. While I fully support prioritizing vaccinations for frontline workers and medical professionals and understand the mental health benefits to keeping children in school, I can't understand why teachers haven't yet been given a place in the vaccination queue. Dr. Chagloff, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a, a very good point. You know, there are areas of, of Ontario, particularly, that have really, really high burdens, and we're seeing schools being shut down in those areas. I think prioritizing teachers within those areas where we're seeing high burdens, where other frontline workers and essential workers are being vaccinated, only makes sense to vaccinate teachers, administrators, the people that clean schools, child care operators, uh, as part of that, as, as realizing that they live in the communities that are in high burden, um, that they're exposed to people and they can't work from home. And uh, again, you know, the safety of continuing schools with everything on, ongoing really does rely on having a, a healthy workforce. Right? Well, and, and just so I'm clear, this is an argument in your mind that extends not just to all kind of essential frontline workers, but to teachers in particular. Yeah, I mean, a teacher should be involved in the essential worker group uh, as part of that rollout, as they are essential workers. They're people that can't work from home that do provide a service in the community where they can be exposed to COVID. Hmm. Uh, speaking of vaccination, Dr. Kirkar, can you take this next question? This is from Paul. I'm wondering, are there any clinical studies for any of the vaccines for youth that have been released or are pending? I'm a parent. Uh, this is a question that I have as well. What do you think? 
So some good news on that front. Last week, Pfizer had their press release. So they released their data on their 12 to 15 year olds, and it looks like the vaccine works great. There were no cases in their uh, vaccine group. So they're actually submitting for emergency use authorization, and potentially the Pfizer one will be approved as early as the summer, if not the fall. Moderna has also finished their enrollment for the 12 to 15 year olds. So that age group potentially will have their vaccines approved by fall. Unfortunately, for the younger children, it's going to be a little bit longer because those studies are still underway and they actually have to do what they call dose escalation studies. So we need to find the right dose. So we're still in phase one, two for the six months to 11 year olds. So good news for the older kids, for the younger kids, it's still going to be a while. Right. So so months away at a minimum, uh, Dr. Chagla, with, you know, vaccination still more of this kind of medium to long term solution. We have gotten a lot of questions about masking. So, so in British Columbia, for example, they're talking about mandatory masking for grades four and up. But the question we commonly get is what about even younger kids? So should grade ones, even kindergartners, be masking more consistently? Yeah, I mean, I, I think especially as things transmit, masking is, you know, an important fail-safe in school. It helps prevent transmission, recognizing that, you know, kids over the age of three or four are able to mask consistently. Um, I would, you know, caution, though, in, around the kindergarten age group, the cognitive abilities of kids and their ability to actually keep it on for a prolonged amount of time, pulling it off, shouldn't necessarily discriminate them about staying in the classroom. But I think certainly after grade one, it could be an expectation. And it's been working in Ontario. We've been able to do that uh, aggressively and um, haven't seen any deleterious side effects from it. And with what we know about transmission in kids, you're saying that the benefits of masking, even for someone as young as grade one or grade two, outweighs the the pain involved in, in making it stick. Yeah, I mean, it's not going to be perfect in that age group, but it probably does provide some help. And it, recognizing that we're putting kids in, in confined classrooms, the ventilation may not be adequate you probably want as many barriers as you can for them to uh, prevent transmission from person to person. Dr. Kakar, what, what does the latest evidence suggest about how vulnerable children actually are, especially with the variants that are circulating? So one thing that's super important to realize is that we're t when we talk about younger people getting it more, they're getting it more, but they're not sicker. So younger children, so under the age of 19, yes, there are increasing cases in schools, and so there are increasing numbers overall, but they're not sicker from the new variant. So across our hospitals here in Canada, we're not seeing a surge in pediatric patients. And it's exactly what they saw in the UK. So even if we have these variants circulating, they're not sicker from it. But let me pick, on some, uh, pick up on something you just said, Dr. Kakar. Is it that that we do believe schools can be a significant driver of transmission? Because I thought the, the early narrative was that schools weren't a place that we had to be overly preoccupied with. So I think two things changed. So that first wave, kids were home. So we weren't seeing, you know, we, we, we weren't seeing high rates of transmission, but now kids are in school. We had winter where there was way less ventilation and we have the variants that are in school and the variants are clearly more transmissible. So. Kids can transmit, they can get the infection, they can transmit the infection. And with these new variants, the issue is that they're more transmissible. So we put everything together in these last winter months, and that's where we've seen this increasing number in schools. Okay, we have time for uh, one more question, Dr. Chagla. Maybe I'll have this one uh, for you. It's a very forward-looking question, maybe a little bit of a scary one. This is from Nathan. Now that we're vaccinating more and more elderly people and older adults, is there a risk that the virus that causes COVID-19 could mutate to become more dangerous for younger adults or even children? Ah, so that, that's kind of interesting. Is that a, a viable possibility? Yeah, I mean, I, there's been a lot of discussion around these variants and mutations. And I think, you know, you have to put it into context. We have had hundreds of millions of people infected in this world. And really, in the context of a year and three months of transmission, we have seen three major mutations emerge that have been you know, part of what we, we talk about on a day-to-day -day basis. As you vaccinate more people, that pool is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And every one of these mutations is a random probability. If you have less and less and less populations, the probability of that mutation happening start shrinking and shrinking and shrinking every day. And so, you know, again, a mass vaccine effort will likely work to reduce the number of variants and mutations 
because that circulating pool, that that chance of having the mutant emerge in the pool starts getting smaller and smaller and smaller as less and less individuals are susceptible to infection. Mm. Okay, Dr. Zane Shagla is an infectious diseases specialist and Dr. Fatima Kakar is an infectious diseases pediatrician. Thank you both of you for your time. Thank you. Um, as Ontario closes more schools, some hospitals are racing to vaccinate in hot spots. This community was hit hard. The community leaders at the front lines of the vaccine rollout. Next. Welcome back. Across Canada, the race to get people vaccinated is increasingly a matter of life and death. In one Toronto COVID hotspot, the race is on. A mobile vaccination team is going building to building, even door to door, giving doses to vulnerable Canadians. Joanna Romiliotis got access to the operation and tonight she brings us along. They usually get a day's notice of where to head to next. COVID keeps spreading. This mobile vaccine team is trying to keep up and bringing in a fighting chance. The location, another residential building in Thorncliffe Park. As the crisis widens, every vial, every syringe drawn from it is an exercise in precision, targeting those at higher risk of getting COVID and of spreading it. So what's your full name? Mohammed. Mohammed Khan works at a grocery store. This is a shot, he says, at staying safe. How do you feel about getting your vaccine? Yeah, I'm so excited and uh, feel good. We're doing vaccinations today. Would you like a shot? A COVID-19 shot. Essential workers getting sick with highly contagious variants are fueling a crushing third wave. And why the team from Michael Garin Hospital is targeting people 50 and older who live in COVID hotspots like this one. Where are you vaccinated? Jakesia Henningham says it's a critical response. Do you think coming to these buildings is the way to go? Yes, I think this is one of the best things we've done because we've gotten more response this way. People are happy to see us come. They think we are putting their needs first and so they come to us. Torncliffe has been a really important step in this journey because this community was hit hard. And for us to come in like this, people are just showing up. Can I get vaccinated? Where can I do it? Hi, we're coming to give you a vaccine. For those who can't make it downstairs, they go to them. There you go. All done, okay? Yes, thank you. There is a sense of hope, but also a sense of urgency, because there are so many to get to. Community leaders are helping identify those at highest risk. There are still people who are not active in the social media or have barriers in terms of accessing technology. But as Sel Panlaki says, just about everyone in this neighborhood is a priority. They racialize newcomers, they're essential workers. Most of them are taking TTC bus, um, the, the subway. Most of them are working in the food industry and so um, they needed the support. This is a community under siege where people work puts them at risk. So does where they live in apartment towers with larger families. Transmission has been high, spreading into schools that are now shuttered. And while there is a new vaccine hub in the area, this is about eliminating one more barrier. Us coming to this building is beneficial for people. Some people would never have come unless we came. Vaccine is a vaccine. You know? Nick Gotera is a first responder. A vaccine for him, he says, helps everyone. Our goal is to have a herd immunity, right? So probably the faster we can do it, the more we quicker we can have it. It's a ways yet to that point, but the hope is this is the best shot of getting there faster. So, Joanna, one thing that is curious is that you are genuinely standing in front of a vaccine hub in that community. So why the need for door-to-door -door there as well? Adrian, I think it speaks to the urgency. There are tens of thousands of people who live in this catchment area and getting to all of them is gonna be a logistical feat. The strategy of going door to door is to also tackle vaccine hesitancy by removing one other barrier of actually coming here, even though it's close. And that's the strategy behind the team, to be nimble, to be quick, to work evenings and holidays to get to as many people as quickly as possible. So the strategy there seems uh, a bit tricky logistically. What does it take to get into those buildings? 
It takes a lot. Hospital staff and community leaders are in constant contact, identifying where they're going to go to next. And that involves getting permission from property managers to set up shop in a lobby or to go door to door. And if they don't get that permission in time, because time is of essence, they'll set up tents outside of buildings. And that's what they're planning to do this week as well. All right, Joanna, thank you for this. You're welcome. Overfishing in parts of BC has devastated herring stocks, but one biologist is trying to revive them. You can bring the whole food chain back. You start with the herring and work up. How the humble herring can bring life back to BC waters, plus. It is a magical experience, surfing with snow all around you. No longer an ocean activity. These guys are riding the freezing waves on an Alberta river. Stay with us. Well, for decades, the Pacific herring was viewed as a virtually inexhaustible resource. But off the coast of British Columbia, stocks are shrinking. A worry not just for the future of the small fish, but for the numerous other animals that rely on it. Greg Rasmussen looks at a group fighting for its survival. It might not look like a promising sanctuary for wildlife. All right. But this biologist is determined to try. I mean, this is probably getting close to a million, maybe a million and a half eggs, if you actually went through and counted them all. Doug Swanston is part of a group working to create a home for herring, transplanting millions of eggs to a site where the fish once spawned. Historically, we had a spawn here in the 1800s. It was a source of food for First Nations communities. The fleets of the fishing companies compete for a share of the catch. Herring was once seen as a nearly limitless resource until overfishing crashed the stocks in the 1960s. Since then, stocks have varied, but were down 60% in a recent four-year period. But still, about 16,000 tons have been caught in this year's commercial fishery. DFO decided not to li listen to their own scientists. Or Indigenous communities and environmental groups have gone to court trying to halt the commercial catch. So, so this site in particular was a village site at one point? It was our summer village site, one of them. For thousands of years, the Tsleil-Waututh people have lived on these shores. Herring was a traditional food until they were largely fished out of existence. You only have to look up the west coast of British Columbia to see where herring still is and to see how Indigenous people harvest there. We did similar things and it was an important food source. The Tsleil-Waututh and other Indigenous groups are working to bring back herring to help the entire ecosystem. This is a more typical net. Vancouver's False Creek is the source of the eggs for the new transplant experiment. Years ago, artificial herring spawning habitat was created by a small group of volunteers hoping to help endangered salmon. The first thing a salmon looks for when it comes out of the river is food. And if you have a herring run right in that area, it's just perfect. You can bring the whole food chain back. If you start with the herring and work up, it can happen. Biologists say there are many reasons why fish stocks in Canada's Pacific Ocean are in serious trouble. You can see it's quite well covered with eggs. But rather than simply watch, some are trying to help. One tiny egg at a time. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. Next on the National, surfing the waves on a cool river. The coldest day I've been out here was minus 28 without the wind chill and that was really, really cold. Yeah, no kidding, those chilly temperatures don't scare these surfers. Next, in our moment. So maybe you think surfing would be most ideal under the bright sun on a warm day and at an ocean, but these Calgarians have a very different idea because they are river surfers and they ride high risk waves no matter the temperature, even if that temperature is sometimes minus 28 degrees. And tonight, the bold surfers are our moment. The coldest day I've been out here was minus 28 without the wind chill. And that was really, really cold. Just every part of me was freezing as soon as it, as soon as it touched the air. It was just freezing. 
Around here, you have to kind of wear a wetsuit all year round anyway, because it's, it's Canada, we're very inland. <laughs> I've attempted ocean surfing once or twice, but uh, mainly river surfing. It is a magical experience, surfing with snow all around you, and it's a great activity all year round. Surfing is just, it's great, it's lovely. <laughs> it's just a happy, happy place, a little bit of paradise. Surfing, surfing in the end. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's important to know they didn't just find that paradise, they built it. Uh, that wave is like now a permanent fixture that, that people can ride for free, but it took about a decade to build, to get the permissions, to place the flat rocks in just the right place. All that effort worth it for them. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and apparently they've, they've built quite a community around it too, right? Like how could you not build a sense of camaraderie when you're, when you're doing that? No but also out of necessity because it's, there's some danger involved. It's in a remote area, not a lot of medical resources around, so they became fast friends. That's The National for this April 6th. Have a great night. Good night.